aperture. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Creating Stories for Tomorrow, a roundtable with the artists Javier Alvarez, Gus Aronson, Widlene Cadet, Yu Chen Chu, and Silvana Trevali, who have each made new photographic series through a special partnership between Aperture and Fujifilm. For those of you who are joining an Aperture event for the first time, Aperture was founded in 1952 as a common ground for the advancement of photography. Through our flagship magazine, publications, exhibitions, and public programs, we connect the photo community with the most inspiring work, the sharpest ideas, and each other in print, in person, less often than usual, and more often now online. Tonight's program is supported in part by generous donations from Aperture's Board of Trustees and our members and other individuals. Aperture's programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with support from Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And a special thanks to Emily Stewart, Aperture's Manager of Education and Engagement Programs. This past year, Aperture and Fujifilm commissioned five emerging photographers to create a new body of work in response to the question, what does tomorrow look like? Very important question at this time. From documenting the current political state in the US to protests in Chile, uh, to intimate and beautiful New York, the photographers captured moments that reflect on what the future might hold. The five artists were given a commissioning fee and Fujifilm cameras with which they made their projects. They each worked with an editor at Aperture to develop a brief, edit their work into a portfolio and craft a narrative around a project. We then published each story on Aperture Online beginning in September with Gus Aronson and continuing through the fall with Yu Chen Xu and Widling Cadet. Javier Alvarez's commission with an essay by Camila Osorio was published yesterday and Silvana Trevali's story with an essay by Laura Cadena will be published in February. So stay tuned. I want to thank my colleagues, Nicole Achampong, Assistant Editor of Aperture and Cassidy Paul, Aperture Digital Editor, who have worked with the artists for the last several months and who have both written and produced amazing stories. At Aperture, both at the magazine and in the books program, we spend about 95% of our time editing existing bodies of work by photographers. So this was really an extraordinary experience and opportunity for us as editors to commission and collaborate on photo essays um, and to shape the interpretation of these new bodies of work for a wide audience. We extend our sincerest thanks to our partners at Fujifilm who gave us the artistic freedom and editorial independence to craft exciting visual stories and crucially, to provide a unique platform for a group of immensely talented artists. We'll have a chance to hear more from Nicole and Cassidy later on this evening. And if you have questions, um, you can add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your frame and we will get to them a little bit later. So we, the way this is gonna work is we're gonna go through and meet each of the artists and look at their work for a few minutes each. And then we will gather as a group and um, take your questions and have conversation about the connections between these five projects. So we will start with Gus Aronson and Gus, could you join us? Super, welcome. Oh, nice. Gus Aronson is a photographer and filmmaker um, based in the Bronx, embracing ambiguous narrative and vivid color as tools to push against ideas of the document. Uh, he rejects the notion of the photographs are purely evidence of time past. He explores how um, photographs can function as tarot cards, relics of the past and roadmaps for the future. Um, Aronson is a recent graduate of Bard College, as recent as last year, May 2020. And he has completed commissions for Aperture and Elle Magazine. Um, and he was also part of the 2020 Aperture Summer Open, which was presented at Photographiska last year. So mm -hmm. Gus's project is called Tokens from New York. And after working with Gus on this project, we were talking about the idea of the wooden nickel, quote unquote, um, about signs or symbols that have mystical value. 
Um, and Gus took the title for his project from um, Joan Silver's absolutely excellent novel, which I recommend called Improvement. Um, and there's a line in the novel um, that refers to tokens from an unwed life. So Gus, can you tell us a little bit about how you developed um, this particular body of work and what interested you um, about the relationship between signs and symbols, but also your roving around um, in New York? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Emily, can you go back to the first mic, please? Thank you. So after graduating in the May in May and not really having a roadmap for for the future with COVID, um, I was sitting in my house in Tivoli. Um, not having left the school area yet. And Brendan sent an email asking the question of what does tomorrow look like? And I started to think about how, what that really meant to me at that exact time of like, I'm about to enter the new world for me. Um, so I returned home to the Bronx and I started therapy um, and I started taking medication. And at that point I started to get really into the idea of portals and reading um, and trying to transport myself from the world of my room and the book um, and find a way to kind of become comfortable um, in the city, which was a lot more dangerous than up in Tivoli. So then I started to, um, can you go to the next image, please? Um, I started to go through different pieces of like the archive in my house. And I found this picture of my grandfather um, from when he was in the military um, and started to think about how seeing this picture was kind of like seeing what I would become later in life, um, seeing how, um, sorry, uh, how I can pull the, so I, so I started to figure out how I could re-photograph that picture of him and see how I could bring the past into the present. Mm -hmm. um, as a way of then looking forward into the future again. Um, can you go to the next picture, please? So then I started to get out of my house um, and start to explore the city. And this is the picture of my sister um, as I was bringing her to her boyfriend's house. Um, and as I was out in the world, I started to see masks everywhere. And how do you photograph the mask? And how do you deal with the current situation we're living in of COVID where it's kind of inescapable um, and you don't want to necessarily date your pictures too much. So um, I tried to think about how you can heighten the picture. Um, and that was a constant challenge. Um, can you hear the next picture, please? I would just add, Gus, for the viewers, that you were the first, um, you were the first project that we commissioned the first in the order that we published. And so you were really working in July and August. Is that right? And I think that was a really yeah. strange time in New York City and we can't emphasize that strangeness enough. I think that comes out um, mm -hmm. in your photographs. So then um, it was exa exactly right. So then you start to meet people out in the streets and you don't really know how to interact with them. So um, I primarily like making portraits of people and trying to traverse that line of um, approaching someone and talking to them and getting to know them and making an intimate picture of them is really hard. But all the people that I approached ended up being extremely um, willing to give a lot to me. So this is Eddie. I met him in Chinatown and um, we talked for an hour and it was just, it was, it was the first time that I'd really talked to someone that was not my family or the people I lived with um, in a long time. So then I started to explore, um, I continued exploring and I came across this, this uh, National Guard recruitment poster. And I started to think about how this kind of represented the way America is right now. It's struggling with its identity. It's, it's in a place of transition. Um, and I thought that it was kind of poignant that someone took out just the face of this picture. Um, when you give yourself to the military, you get, a, you get a lot, there's a lot of promises. America has a lot of promises, but there's also a lot of realities that are different than that. Um, and I was thinking about how my grandfather who was in the military, what the promises were for him and what the promises are for people today and how that's very different. Um, this is Ryan. I met him in, on a, in a skate park at 181st Street um, in Washington Heights. And, and he's um, a kind of mystic character, is that right? Very mystic character. Um, he makes wonderful pictures actually on his Instagram. Um, uh, and he, 
he also, he crafts a lot and this was his recovery necklace. And we had a conversation about, about COVID and, and respect and he starts to see the world in sixes. It's six, everything six feet apart. And we have the mask, which has become in his eyes, the sixth sense. Um, and he, he thinks it should be three. He thinks that there should be a three party system and uh, the triangle, three points is the strongest shape. Um, and just this, this idea of the, the portal that he, that he wears every day, um, this sign of recovery and of moving on in the future is a lot, was really um, meaningful to me. Yeah, like a power, like a power object. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then the last picture, I started to think, I, I passed this on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and it caught my eye first of all, because I thought, thought it was really hilarious to see all these presidents playing pool together. But then there's the same painting in the background and I thought about how time kind of repeats itself. It's cycling through. There's, if, if we don't pay attention to time, then it repeats itself. Um, but then there's also the coexistence of time where all these presidents from different eras are, are living or are hanging out together. Um, and I was thinking, so you photograph the future by photographing the present and really paying attention to how history is folding into the present and rolling out into the future. Um, and I'm glad you ended yeah. on this picture because it looks like a double or a triple exposure, but it's just actually a series of reflections and pictures within pictures. And I think it's a good one to end on because you've shown us some fortune tellers, a military personnel, lots of portals, and then, you know, pull up politicians, as we've learned, are also subjected to magical thinking. So um, I think this is a very appropriate image um, for us to publish last year and also shows your great eye for um, street photography. Um, Gus, we'll leave it there for the moment, but come back to you um, a little later um, with the whole crew. So thanks so much. And Yu Chen, could you now join us? I almost feel like we want more contrast with you know, um, I'm glad to welcome Yu Chen Chu, a lens-based artist uh, based in Brooklyn. She takes a poetic approach to telling stories about uh, immigrant, about migration and belonging. Raised in Taiwan, Yu Chen spent half of her life in the United States and her experience as an immigrant um, with, as she describes it, an internalized cultural conflict has strongly influenced her artistic approach. In 2018, she was the recipient of an Enfoco Photography Fellowship and her work has been exhibited around the world, including at Fotogravisca in New York, the South Street Seaport, also in New York, the Fort Wayne Museum of Art in Indiana, and at the Louvre in Paris. Um, we were excited to work with Yu Chen for a number of reasons. First of all, she's a great maker of um, very beautiful, elegant um, black and white imagery. But Yu Chen surprised us um, in a great way by also um, taking the opportunity of this commission to make some video work, um, one of which we just um, viewed and um, really adds an interesting counterpoint, um, both with the color, use of color and the sound. Yu Chen, I wanted to ask you about, um, you describe your series for um, Aperture and Fuji film called Separated Together mm -hmm. um, as a visual poem about the social landscape during the Trump administration. And your previous body of work, um, which we actually showed at the Aperture Summer Open was also about um, American themes. Can you tell us about your approach to this project and how it grew out of your, um, your wider interest in photographing American ideas and landscapes? Sure. Um... So for this commission project, uh, separated together, um, I think it serves as a continuation of my uh, long-term project, America Scene, which captures the, long, uh, the social landscape of the United States during the Trump administration. So I think how I got started with this project can trace back to last year in March, uh, when the pandemic hits the United States badly. So at the time, I feel the personal urge and also 
um, the responsibility as a photographer to capture uh, what's you know happening around me. And then I received this timely invitation from Aperture uh, about a commission project. And this is how this project got started and came to life. Um, so when I think about you know what future looks like, I think about history. And um, I would say it's because history repeats and I'm curious at how history you know, reshape our future. So in 2020, we had the COVID-19 pandemic and then we have the Black Lives Matter social movement and the um, modern reassessment of the historical monuments. And then we have the presidential election. So uh, I want to weave these collective experiences um, to examine uh, the new chapter of the United States uh, that faces today and also like how the historical narrative shapes our future. So when I envision how this project could be, I'm thinking about, you know, I want the audience to uh, feel they are on the go. They are, you know, in, they are in a journey of exploration. So that's why I incorporate the video pieces um, to this story to um, create a depth and more you know, dimension to the narratives. Um, I remember when we spoke yeah. at the beginning of the commission and we, you yeah. were talking a about monuments, but yes. you, you, re you beautifully expanded beyond monuments and to take in a really meditative approach to a number of landscapes. Where, where did you make all these pictures? Um, I would say uh, those pictures uh, for the for for the ones of the monuments they um, they they were actually taken in different places. But uh, the one on the screen it actually um, is the Columbus Monument and it's in front of the uh, Supreme Court in Brooklyn Borough Hall. So. Um, I particularly, I, I particularly interested in, you know, like those like um, monuments or historical like uh, memorials that associate with uh, racial justice, because um, I'm curious like how um, these monuments were presented in our public space, and also like how our perspective of history um, alters this uh, monuments meaning, since the definition of greatness changes by our eras. Yeah, you, and you talk about greatness and how greatness changes at different points in history, and that's why yeah. monuments can be so um, vexing and complicated for us. But yeah, the, and I'm glad we're looking at this image because how do the mm -hmm. images of uh, monuments, which might have a um, in, invite us mm -hmm. very charged feeling at the moment, relate to an image like this with photographs within photographs or some of the landscapes of uh, you know spaces that we don't necessarily recognize? How does they all fit together? So I think uh, the idea behind like to kind of like intertwine like historical monuments and like the social landscape and also like uh, those historical events happened uh, last year is because I want to give it more like a multiple depths of the narrative to, you know, how we can envision uh, the future we like to be. So for example, for, um, for this image, uh, when I took this image, I've, I just think it's kind of interesting because as you can see in the front, those are the posters of you know, people like, who unfortunately you know, passed away or died because of the, um, the, uh, the social movements. Um, and you can still see like the shadow of the fences on these posters. So I think it's also, for me, I feel it's kind of um, a metaphor of what we are standing in our history uh, right now. And in the back is, uh, you can see there's like an empty uh, ground and we have the, um, the skyline of Manhattan mm -hmm. as a backdrop. So, well, yeah. A beautiful contrast because you have very, fir you know, memorials in granite that mm -hmm. are going to last forever and these very temporary memorials that look Poignant, and I was struck by the the um, similarity between this image and Gus's image of, of the military um, mm -hmm. site in um, absence and loss of the face. Um, I wanted to ask you 
about your video works and why you chose to make those in color and specifically why you um, slowed down. And for those of you who would like to see um, more videos, they're linked out of the article that um, we published about Yu Chen's work mm -hmm. and I'm looking at them. But yeah, can you talk about the speed and the color? Sure. Yeah, so um, the reason for um, to leave uh, the video in color is because um, first I want, um, okay, first I should talk about why I, um, I make this image in black and white because um, I want to, you know, give a sense of uncertainty and also like a dreaming and also like a flashback and force of the memory. So, mm -hmm. and I think the black and white can present, you know, this kind of atmosphere pretty well. Um, and so the, uh, so the, uh, the audience, they can just focus on the subject matter. But for the video piece, as I mentioned, like, I want the audience, they feel like they are in the journey. So for this video pieces, I feel um, they are uh, act more like, you know, casually more like a personal documentation of what's happening right now. So it's kind of bring back, you know, like the audience to the reality. And I want it to feel, it's more like someone, you know, like they document, you know, the moment with their iPhone or just with their mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are not like a perfectly, you know, like a framed, but it can give you a sense of, you know, it's in real time and it's what, you know, we are facing today. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a beautiful series and I, I, we should come back in the Q and A later on about the question of greatness, because I think that's a really important, um, that's a really important question that you've posed about how we, we experience greatness and we experience monumentality depending on our context and in, in time and we have to constantly reevaluate those feelings. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. We'll now invite um, Widlene, please, to join us. Hi, Widlene. Hi, Brandon. <laughs> uh, nice to see you. So Widlene um, Cadet is an artist who's practice draws from personal history. Um, she examines race, memory, erasure, migration, and Haitian cultural identity in the United States using photography, video, and installation. Um, Widlene has uh, earned her uh, BA in studio art from the City College of New York and recently her MFA from Syracuse University um, and has published her work in the New Yorker and Time Magazine and Wallpaper and she also photographed President Biden and which in a fantastic portrait that was published in the New Yorker last fall. Um, and she's currently based um, in New York and um, has won a very prestigious artist in residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. So Wilene, it's really great to have had the chance to work with you before you get into the rocket ship and, <laughs> and go off to do amazing things for everyone. Um, so, you made a body of work um, in Syracuse mostly, but you can tell us a little bit about the locations um, if you would like to um, at the end of the summer, at the beginning of the fall. Nicole um, at Champong and her essay about your commission um, calls you the photographer who erased time. What does that mean to you? And what does, um, yeah, what does erasure mean to you? And what ideas are you thinking about in this? new body of work? Yeah, um, when I first got the email to make this body of work, I was finishing up my MFA in Syracuse and a lot of things, there was, it was a lot of uncertainty at the time. And so before even thinking about what I would make the work about, what I would talk, what pictures I would even, if I was even capable of making images at the time, I decided to say yes <laughs> to <laughs> the request. And so, one of the things that I decided to do was focusing on more of the minute things that I was experiencing during the pandemic, but also thinking about how those minute things can lead to greater things like greater feelings of joy or loneliness and things like that. And so I was living in Syracuse when I started making the images for this body of work. I was living alone because my roommate had gone back home to Canada. And so I was living alone in this apartment and this very isolated part of 
um I guess it wasn't very isolated it was just like there where I was living was pretty quiet and so I would spend weeks without going outside um and without seeing other people at times as well and so I started making these images of like how I would be spending my time during that period and a lot of it was that I was spending my time I was alone and I was spending my time inside my house and just thinking about small going on walks along you no know, like paying attention to the light and I think one of the things that happened as a result of having all of this time to myself was that I sometimes would find that I lost track of time and I wanted to communicate that in the pictures and trying to I guess in some ways erase time like Nicole mentioned in her beautiful piece thank you Nicole and I think show the passage of time as well and the way that I was capturing these small things like the way the water um, moves the way the leaves change color in between season and the way like the colors especially change when it's like different kinds of sunset um, between summer and fall I think all of those little things were like the things that like helped me keep track of time, but also thinking about the idea of, I think one of the things that I experienced as well was that I felt like I was living so many different lifetimes within this short period from March to the end of last year because so many things kept happening and it just all felt more and more realistic as the year went by. So I think one of the reasons I chose the title that I chose for the body of work, you won't be here forever, because it seemed like every time I think or I thought that I was at like stable ground, things changed, things shifted. I had to move out of my apartment. I moved back to New York. And so I think, yeah, I wanted to capture those transitions in a way too. Did you have a sense when you started that you were going to be mixing color and black and white? It's really interesting to see the pictures flip by because the even the color images are made up of just a few colors in fact mm -hmm. they're they're like almost like black and white images in a way I mean I was I didn't realize that until I see them again now but did you have that in your mind at the beginning or did you kind of take a lot of pictures and then in the editing process begin to mix the sensibilities of the color and the black and white I think both in terms of the color sensibility, um, there is a certain kind of palette that happens um, that I like get obsessed about. And so I try and capture it over and over again. Even if I don't try, I find that I'm attracted to it over and over again. And so, yeah, I think the colors are like little notes that I keep going back to, yeah, back and forth and yeah, in between the black and white. Did you feel that this project was the beginning of something or did is it really located in a specific moment now that you've you left Syracuse and that you erased that period, that period of time has been erased, I guess, and now you're in a new space? Or I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, or, or are you continuing work and you want to build upon the ideas that were generated, you know, as part of this commission? I think it was the beginning of something and I think especially in terms of how I've been working in terms of making images before I think for the past three years I was in grad school I had a very structured way of making images which was that it was very um posed very uh, calculated and very much like going into the making beef with like certain ideas and preconceptions before I even start and I think that making this series I had to let go of a lot of that Mm -hmm. just because I didn't have access to the same people that I usually photograph and I didn't have yeah maybe not the capacity to do it the same way that I usually do it as well yeah Emily could we go back one slide I just wanted when you said that about access to um, subjects Nicole um, writes beautifully in her piece about um, people at, at a distance and I think this image in particular is a very socially distant image it's mm -hmm. it's very very 2020 image it's beautiful and the figure kind of disappears and reappears as you as you look at it I find it very poignant and I just wanted to um Nicole is kind of like our in-house poet at Aperture so I wanted to <laughs> just read 
this line uh, from her piece because I think it speaks a lot with lean to your work and Nicole writes, the subjects are a mixture of cadets loved ones, total strangers and herself and cadets avoidance in telling the viewer the difference serves as another way of hiding, holding back her relationship to the figures so they may all be ambiguously loved. I think that- I love that line. It's so good. And I think that gets at what you, 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 you gave us in this body work, a very particular tenderness um, that I think people who lived through last fall can identify with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe we have, maybe, and this image is a good one to end on. And um, can you just tell us what this image means to you? Because I understand that this is a kind of farewell image to your apartment in Syracuse. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, I ended up having to move in the beginning of August. Yes, beginning of August. Um, and so I was living in this apartment for three years since I moved to Syracuse. And it was one of those, I think I had, I was living there for three years and then I ended up staying there for like at the height of the pandemic from March through August. And so I always had um, this apartment as like a safe haven to return to whenever I would like go travel elsewhere or even just like, just to relax. And so I took this picture maybe as I, yeah, as I was in the process of packing and moving out. And so I think it's one of those pictures that when I say that it's, I spent, it felt like I lived a bunch of lifetimes during the pandemic where I had to say goodbye to so many things and also people as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But there's something of what Nicole calls the cautious optimism um, in that the close viewer will note that one of your own pictures from a previous series is within this picture. And I, I personally see that as moving can, and change can be good and um, I assume that that picture within will find its way onto a wall somewhere. And there, that, that gesture of hanging it up somewhere new can be as meaningful as leaving a place, so. Yeah, absolutely. I will also just mention that Widleen um, made a commission for Aperture Magazine's spring 2021 issue, which will be on newsstands in March and it's so good and we can't wait. <laughs> so, we will hear more from you in a few minutes. Um, Widleen, thanks so much. And um, Javier, could you please join us? Hello. Hi. Now, I forgot to ask earlier, are you in Brooklyn? Are you back in Brooklyn after your travels? I am, I am, yes, I'm back in Brooklyn now. I, you were in Chile for a long time this fall. I, yeah, well, so as, you know, many of my colleagues, uh, everything started and like this invitation came just like very timely and uh, I was thinking on going to Chile actually back in last March uh, March yeah 2020 and uh, you know the walls started falling apart and just you know got sort of like obligated to stay here in the states and then um, and then when I wanted to go back home uh, for this commission I was planning to stay only three four weeks I ended up staying 10 and I uh, came back, yeah, like the first week of December. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're glad you came back. <laughs> I'm glad to be back too. Um, I, so I will to introduce you. So Javier Alvarez is a documentary photographer um, focused on social issues and human rights in neglected communities. Um, after completing a BFA in photography in Santiago, Alvarez worked as a freelance editorial and press photographer um, for agencies in Sao Paulo and Santiago. Um, in addition to his personal and commissioned work, he's a contributor to um, the Brazilian activist and independent journalist platform, Media Ninja. Um, Javier, your series is called Invisible Landscape and you say that you wanted to focus on um, what you describe as what is left that nobody thinks about. Um, and this is in relation to a series of nationwide protests that gripped Chile um, beginning in October, 2019. For those of us, including myself, and I imagine uh, others on the call who might be unfamiliar, uh, could you just give us a little bit of the political context um, for this body of work? Yes, well, I I'll try to squeeze it in like, you know, a couple of minutes, but um, yeah, long story short, basically uh, for the past 
30 years since the since Chile was like under a dictatorship uh, until 1991, 1990, 1991, uh, we're being guided and ruled by a constitution that was written by. Uh, the dictator. So a um, lot of the social problems has been withheld by this little tiny book that uh, it just like made uh, the entire country just stop from one day to another in October uh, 18. Uh, and this all the social reforms has been like a long crisis that it, it just exploded from one day to another. And uh, everything related with like, you know, social security, things like education, uh, health, um, the distribution of wealth and all of the horrible things that like we can think about and how to, and why society is like, you know, just on crisis right now. Um, it's, it, it was sort of like the excuse for people to just basically start protesting against the government. And, um, as me as a photographer and also as a like a, 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 a someone who was very actively in the streets when I, back in the days when I was a student, uh, it it sort of like symbolized and 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 it sort of like also like represented like just the peak of uh, this uh, you know just anger and like bitterness that like the, the the entire you know country was being feeling for decades. So um, that's that's what I was mentioning that like was so timely when the uh, I got I you know one day I got your email asking me if I wanted to you know think about what does tomorrow look like, and because of the uh, the pandemic and also uh, you know just like life in general I wasn't able to be there when all of this started back in October two thousand nineteen, and so I was like having lots of like thoughts about how can I me from the distance from like being away how can I be actively uh, uh, engaged or committed you know in a in a in not not in like in the fight itself but like um, uh, how, how can I take a position not only as a photographer but also like as a, as a, as a Chilean as a citizen and uh, I guess like I start thinking on uh, I don't know if I'm going too far with this, but like, I guess I just start thinking on like, uh, uh, for whom like th this, this tomorrow will look like. And, and that's, I think when I start thinking on, um, on what is left behind, you know, like the, 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 the victims, because, and, and like also like a type, and this is, this is awful, but like, it, it's, it's true, it's the type of victims, you know, that they were the ones that were mutilated, uh, people that's like on jail, actually right now after a year, and the ones that, are, that, that they were either murdered or they were found dead in bus stops, supermarkets, or I don't know, in the street. This picture on the screen now is a good starting point for diving into your work a little bit. And um, Camilla yeah. writes about it in her essay. But Javier, you're, I understand that one of the points um, that you were aiming toward with this photo essay was to reach out to and to tell the stories of families who um, may have lost loved ones as a result of um, the political crisis and the demonstrations. So can you tell us a little bit about how you contacted these families, how you worked with them and how you made pictures with them and what they were able to um, share with you? Sure. Uh, so when uh, if Again, from the distance, from being being away was very difficult for that, for for the the the, the whole like pre-production part because, uh, it, over an email or a chat, it, it, it was very difficult to create like a, a, a like a like a like a bond or like some type of trust. So um, I use my resources as a as a photojournalist as a as a former photojournalist in Chile. And I start contacting people that I was already reporting. There was they were on the field constantly since this whole thing started. So through them, I had the chance to talk to them, and I also had a very good partnership with uh, International Amnesty, and they were uh, able to help me after going through like a super super uh, like meticulous screening process because 
you know they want to they want to protect their people and and because of that i was able to to get some contact information from these families and a little bit also of my own research social media it's super helpful too and but it wasn't until i literally just got there and i think that was also like the the the, the factor that like was or sort of like made me stay longer for 10 weeks because because people you know people want to talk about this and and people the, these families they want to they want to make people know what happened with them because they're looking for justice or you know exposure but they also feel very you know just cautious about like exposing themselves and 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 who, to whom they're sharing their 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 secrets they're you know opening the doors of their houses and uh it took a long time for me to create that and a lot of visits without taking the camera out of my bag mm -hmm. and uh it was sort of like was also i was trying to to achieve because I wasn't there for the for the news for the breaking news because I was already late. So I was I, I sort of like wanted to use that on my you know on my advantage to you know mm -hmm. just think more deep more than far. So uh, it was sort of like a mix of coincidences and and a lot of patience and, and uh, you know it's I'm, I'm I'm still working on that in terms of uh, the, the the amount of families and stories that I, I want to achieve. I, I hope to make them, to portray their stories to mm -hmm. all of them. They're like over 40 now. And, and, and the number keep just raising more and more, which is horrible. But um, the other side, it's, it's, it's good for them that they're getting their exposure. And it only takes time to, you know, create this, this uh, trust bridges. Definitely. Um, and you mentioned that you were a protester 10 years ago or more, how has it been for you to be on the other side to, to document it? And how was your experience compounded by, you know, the pandemic and the effect of the pandemic in Chile? So that was a weird part because like people, it was, it's sort of like what I felt when the, the protest started here in New York after the murder of George Floyd. And from one day to another, people just start going out in the streets. And then we saw all the bars open in the restaurants and was like, okay, if, I guess if people is going out of the protest, we can go to a restaurant. And it's like, you know, I, I for me as a, as a professional, I was like, you know, staying safe, you know, wearing the right PPE, you know, all the equipment and all the stuff because I needed to, you know, see more people at their houses. So I was very cautious, but not all the people. Like they just sort of like forgot that we were going on through this like horrible pandemic and and a lot of people without masks a lot of a lot of just effervescence that were sort of like making the whole like you know health crisis just this sort of like disappear so it was a weird mix of uh from my perspective uh a weird experience of uh of like i don't know like 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 a reason to be out in the street is like we shouldn't be out here processing because it's dangerous yeah but also they had so many reasons to be there too so yeah. it was a weird weird, weird 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 thing yeah well you i understand that you submitted some 500 pictures to us uh and worked with nicole um really carefully on editing them down but that's amazing because it sounds like there are many more stories that will come out of this particular commission and um, that definitely definitely need to be told. And also, I appreciate that you've helped us take our focus off the narcissism of the United States and our political, our own political crisis this year and help us to think about things that are happening elsewhere in a really poetic um, and moving way. So um, more to come from you in just a moment, Javier. Um, yeah. We'll now turn to Silvana, uh, if you could join us, please. Hello, Silvana. Uh, Silvana Travali is a photographer based in London, um, but currently in Venezuela. Her portrait um, based work is a fusion between documentary and fashion. Um, the escalating crisis in her home country of Venezuela motivated her to produce a series about Venezuelan youth which was presented um, in a 2020 solo show in London um, and at Vogue Italia's Photo Vogue 
festival in 2020. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Cassidy Paul, who is working with Silvana on this project, which hasn't even been published yet. So you are all getting an exclusive, very exclusive preview. Um, and Laura Cadena will be providing an essay um, for this, which we'll publish next month. And Cassidy is the expert on this now. So I'll turn it over to her and we'll all join you for the Q&A in just a few minutes. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so Savannah, we're currently working on this project together. You're in Venezuela at the moment shooting for this. Um, do you just want to give a little bit of an introduction of kind of what your idea has been behind this and um, the kind of themes you're exploring? Yeah, so like um, when I got the email from Brendan as well, I was like, I was in, in, in England. I was up north with my, my boyfriend and his family. And all the flights were close to Venezuela, so I kind of felt like, you know, before I could actually go home. Um, and it was about, I think, about 10 months or more that the flights were closed. And it just, it was so, it was just, I just felt strained from, like, my human connection that I'm used to. And of course, like, you know, with, like, with everything that has been going on with COVID, like, we cannot, like, I, I love to hug people, <laughs> like, everyone around me. And I, I was lacking that connection, like, that physical connection with people. And when I got the question, I was like, what does tomorrow look like? I always try and see everything as a hopeful, like optimistic view. So I just, I just, I, I was like, oh, why, why not focus on what's missing for me? Like the physical connection with my family and my friends, you know, everything that we're lacking at the moment, like still. So, so then I went and I like, for me, I love to travel and like, I was lucky to travel a bit, maybe a bit naughty, but um, I just, you know, I, I just went like to Greece and uh, this this image in the screen is in Venezuela. I just shot that last week actually. Um, so yeah, but I just went to Greece um, and I just, just kind of like went to the sea. That's where I get inspired. Like for me, the sea represents, it's like, I, like this metaphor of like rebirth, like that's how I connect to home and that's how I connect to like my comfort zone. And that's where I went to photograph and that's when I started. Um, and I just found like couples and like, you know, brothers, sisters, like friends, you know, and I just focused on like, you know, what, why, what, like what I want to see in the future, like what I, what I hope that we're not scared to like hug and like show physical connection and physical, physical affection because of the pandemic. So that's kind of how I started and that's uh, how I continued. And I still kind of, I still want to go through that uh, while I'm here. Um, but yeah, that's the main, like the main original idea of the project. Mm -hmm. So you you have been traveling a bit. Do you want to talk a bit about the places you've gone and are photographing for for this? Yeah. So I that that image in the screen that showed that in Greece, and I started in Greece, and then I went to Ireland for a commission, another commission, and I just kind of was naughty and I started shooting for Aperture as well, <laughs> and then um, and then I went to oh my god Italy as well. Um, I just I just had to find an excuse to travel and like it's just perfect excuse for me to go and like you know kind of you know find I guess like get inspired by a new place and like people around me and then I also shot some stuff in London where I'm based and now I'm in Venezuela so it's like it has been like this project has been all over different places so mm -hmm. that's maybe you can see that in the images as well. I think there's there's a lot of uniformity despite kind of like these various locations that's brought together by the beach. But um, I mean, it's so, when I first saw these images, I was so kind of like shocked in a good way to see these moments of like physical touch that is just like, it's not happening right now. And I'm, I mean, I think I'm interested to hear how you've approached shooting these with all the kind of social distancing measures that are in place. Like when like in the, in the Greece, it was like if there was no pandemic, which is really weird. I still kept my distance; it was safe. Um, but it, like people were so willing to, you know, to just play around. Like I explained to what I wanted, what I, what I wanted to do, and they were like, "Yeah, for sure." And like like these kids, I spent like four hours with them, um, and I, we just played like volleyball and all these things. Um, so everyone everyone has been so nice and so kind, and like of course, like we kept it safe as much as we could, really, but. Yeah, it, it, even though we're like, I think everyone is lacking that like connect, like like that connection with people as well because we're just so restricted at the moment. So, I definitely had really good like positive feedback and like everyone was nice about it. 
as you've been shooting this, like from your initial kind of concepts and ideas, is there anything come up that like has changed from that kind of initial approach or that you've learned through doing this? Yeah, definitely. I think as, as the images go, there's like, there's like a, I guess like a division of like, you know, these images of like physical connection, physical touch. And then there's like these self portraits that I started um that the Fuji films cameras are actually amazing for that because you can see the screen for people that like technological things um it's amazing for self-portraits and like that's something that I started doing I I, I barely do self-portraits and this is like it was just like a perfect way to incorporate myself in this project because of course like you know this this whole thing started from me and my like myself so yeah that that self-portrait that's one of them and I guess it's just like a like a contrast between what I hope for the future, what I hope that happens and what I hope we go back to, but also what we're going through. It's like, well, what I went through and what we're going through is really like we're facing ourselves like because we're alone at home and like in you know, lockdown, it's like forcing us to, I guess like, how do you say that, confront ourselves in this lonely time. And, and that's kind of why I started the self portraiture Mm -hmm. And I just wanted, like, I just wanted to explore like my body really, image in images. And I think it's like, I mean, you've you've approached yourself portraiture in this black and white, which makes it just kind of feel more of that like solitude and this loneliness that we're experiencing yeah. by ourselves in quarantine. And I think it's it's a really nice contrast against um, your kind of color portraits at the beach. You said that this is your first time kind of engaging in self portraiture, correct? I did it one time, but it just, it, not properly. So yeah, that's definitely the first real time of doing self-portraits, yeah. yeah. This, this one actually is my mom. Um, but I guess like for me, just my mom is like kind of like the same thing. So um, yeah, definitely there's a division between them. Well, I think we probably need to go to the group Q&A, but I hope that everyone stays tuned to watch out for this series. Um, it's going to come out in February. I'm really um, excited to be working with Silvana on it. I think the work's gorgeous and I can't wait to share the full project. Um, I guess everyone can turn on our videos now. Yes, welcome back everyone. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your work so quickly and succinctly. It's really amazing to see the connections between all of them visually and thematically. Um, I want to turn it over to Nicole and Cassidy who um, worked so intensely on this project and I think they have some questions for the um, group and then um, as I mentioned before um, feel free to enter questions into the Q&A box and we will post them um, to the group. Hi, um, yeah, the, I'm Nicole. I'm the assistant editor of uh, Aperture Magazine. And it's such a treat to be able to see all of your work kind of together. And as Brendan mentioned at the beginning, we've definitely been thinking of you all as a collective, but listening to you speak, I'm really starting to see some of these threads that um, are really fascinating to me. And one of those is just, um, I feel like a lot of you are working either explicitly, but some more subtly with politics and the political political condition that we're all dealing with. And I'm wondering um, about all of your thoughts about your relationship between advocacy and art making, and you know, certainly Yu Chen and Javier dealing very explicitly with protests and civil unrest. And I'm curious if you see your work as its own type of protest, or do you feel like it's speaking a different language? Maybe Javier can start. Sure. Yeah, I, I feel that, especially as, as Chilean, uh, it wasn't the time for me to be like super objective as a photojournalist. I, I thought that was important for me to take a position. I mean, it, you always are, you, you always have a position and even, even though when you're, when you're shooting. So I, I thought that it was very important for me to made a type of work that will that will mean something not only for me but also for a, a society and I, I mean I my intentions were not like to create like something huge out of this but that at least will be meaningful for at least these families and 
And, and because of that, I will be already, you know, just standing in a side, in one side of the, of this like battlefield. So I, I mean, it's, I, I think it's always, it's always in, in, important and it's always, it's always going to happen that you're going to be in one side or the other, uh, no matter how objective you, you, you want to be, you know? And so I, I thought about um, just trying to mix my political views and, 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 you know, like social beliefs into something that like, it will be like shared, not only by um, just you know, a few group of people that will, you know, see this body of work as something purely aesthetic, but also something, you know, important for this portion of time for that place and these people. So, uh, so for me, I, um, I think my approach is more because I'm not trying to provide a, the answer, you know, to the audience, but I'm more lean on, you know, want uh, this image to act as a catalyst to make people curious or, you know, wonder and think. So that's why uh, when I probably I sh when when I document the surroundings, I try not to, I try to make, you know, the images that's more metaphoric or more poetic or more like, um, like a bridge to invite people to come to join the conversation with me through the images. So I think um, that's the purpose uh, for me as a photographer that I want to provide. Oh yes, please, Gus. <laughs> you asked about being directly political or not. And I think that, you know, images are really latent and they will change as you look at them over time. And it's inevitable that I think pictures you take that don't, you don't mean them to be political, I think might become gradually more political as time goes on. Um, and I, I think, just when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I realized th this thread of the military through, throughout my work, and I did not intentionally like photograph military things only, but um, I was seeing this, this thread where I, I photographed a veteran, I photographed the, uh, the, the recruitment poster, my, the photo of my grandfather, and I started to find this connection to that and then the presidents and how the presidents control the political lens, the, the military and, and the way that veterans are treated then and now. And I think politics is inevitable in pictures because they change meaning. Yeah, I know working with, um, with Lean, um, we talked a lot about how you weren't necessarily interested in zooming in on masks or um, really anything that was explicitly talking to this time period. And, and Gus, you also, I heard you mentioning about how you didn't really want your photos to be dated. Um, and I guess I'm just curious, uh, maybe with Lean, if you would like to talk about the way you were sort of creating what I see as a bit of a reprieve that is its own statement about our current events, even if it's not explicitly dealing with them. Yeah, I think um, you hit it on the nail. I think even if, well, like I guess specifically thinking about photographing the mask as like one of the things that signals where we're, what time we're living in now, I think even the absence of it um, can be something that tells you about what time we're living in now. And so I think when I try, when I, I try not to include it because I didn't want, I, I looked at, I spent a good amount of period living in it and I didn't want it in my images and so, yeah, I think it was my way of trying to create my own world, my alternative world to the one we were living in, to the one we were experiencing, which wasn't that pleasant, honestly. <laughs> so yeah. We have a really great um, question from the audience, um, from Liz. And Liz asked, I'm reminded of Ansel Adams and Negative Space by Woodlean's discussion of erasure and Javier's discussion of absence. Um, could they comment on the inspiration they may have had? Do 
do you want to start Javier do, did you have any um photographer in mind or a set of ideas about um absence that you literary or cinematic or anything that you informed your vision for this project uh, I wasn't I wasn't thinking in like any in particular as, as a like a, as a reference per se but I I guess it just go back to this feeling of being late again because I, I just wasn't there like when this whole thing started so I I, I thought about feeling that we were like I, and I'm never gonna forget like a, 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 um, like a conversation that I had with a former teacher when I was uh, in, in college. And he was like, well, empty spaces are sometimes like this, like the first, the first frame uh, either at the beginning of a, a scene when the role, you know, it's, it's happening on the camera or when it's pretty much ending the scene. So it's, it's like this, this tension that uh, it's it's staying there and it's gonna stay there forever that it doesn't happen with any other medium that but photography and how can you photograph something that already happened you know like and I thought about this this vibe this mood that like it's it, it can be referred to many maybe other of uh, I don't know like I don't want to say like types of photography but like not like maybe it's directly related with photojournalism or documentary photography where things are supposed to happen, you know, on the frame. And so I was like, maybe the absence doesn't, doesn't have to be with an action, but like with the idea of, of the loss, it does something that is not there, that it should be there, you know, like these people should be there. So I think that's probably like my, my relationship with the, the idea of like not having something and like how to photograph that, how to approach that. And for you, Adeline? Um, I think in terms of inspiration, I was watching a lot of um, movies, specifically um, Hayao Miyazaki movies at the time. And so I was interested in the idea of abstraction being like this thing that I wanted to communicate, but also have, I wanted the images to be abstract in some ways, but I also think that even if I make them abstract, the fact that I'm making them for this specific purpose at this specific time, and I'm going to talk about them in the context of when I'm making them, they do still talk about the time that we're living in now. And so I think, yeah, I guess I was thinking about, yeah, I think Studio Ghibli movies was probably the primary <laughs> inspiration at the time. Well, as a um, last question, I, I was, I want to kind of do a round robin so we have a chance to hear from all of you very briefly before we have to sign off. But um, Cassidy and Nicole, I was hoping you could just talk briefly about your experiences, editors um, on this project, on and your opportunity to collaborate with these artists. And with the, for the artists, um, can you talk a little bit about how this commission um, pushed your work in a new direction possibly and helped you um, maybe face some of the challenges of um, making images in 2020. So we're, I'm going to start with Nicole and Cassidy, and then we're, I'll, I'll call on you according to the random grid on my own screen. <laughs> Um, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I felt really lucky to work with both with Lean and Javier, and I think it was especially fulfilling because you were both coming at the commission from such different angles, you know, um, with Lean, that abstraction was so evident from the beginning and from our earliest conversations and your interest in not necessarily having this linear narrative. And uh, I feel like I learned a lot through just that process of how do we shape a story that isn't necessarily a beginning, middle, end kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and then Javier, I feel like, uh, as I sort of was asking earlier about the political implications of your work, um, I think it was such a wonderful experience to understand how you connected with your subjects. And, and you know, despite kind of the chaos of the environment, I think everybody here, it's like working through the pandemic, working through these circumstances, they were really chaotic conditions. Um, so yeah, I think seeing the way that your work developed to, um, and shifted, you know, in necessary ways was um, really fundamental to the process. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, well, as 
Brendan mentioned at Aperture, we don't get many chances to really kind of like shape a project from a beginning to the end. And I felt really excited to work with Gustavana and Yu Chen. Um, Yu Chen's series came out in October and um, it was still, I feel like when we were in these like very tense times and it was, there was so much like emotion and like every single day. And I remember just meeting with her like week to week and just looking at these images and they were therapeutic in a way. Um, they're very calming. It's such a poetic series. Um, I really loved working on it with her. And then with Silvana, it's been this moment of like hope and kind of beauty that has been also therapeutic. And it's like so calming to just see these images. I'm, I'm glad that this is kind of the last installment of this series. I think it's a really nice note to end on together. Um, so yeah, I've just, I've really enjoyed this experience. It's been so amazing. Absolutely. Well, Silvana, why don't we go to you? Do you have any, um, anything to say briefly about how this, this project kind of may have put you in a new direction or? Well, it definitely was like, it was amazing to first work with you guys. Like I've always loved your platform. So it was a really good thing to like start the kind of like pandemic with. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it was like a, like it really pushed me to continue to make work. Like it really like, it was, cause I was doing my MA in, the, in that time. So it was like, it was just like something that I was completely out outside of my like fashion war work. Like I, it was like a, like a documentary away, a documentary project that I could just carry on and do and like with a new camera. And like, it was so, it's just great. Um, so it was, and also self portraiture that I finally like, I just pushed myself to do it. And it definitely has like, like he has made me understand myself and my body better, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, he's amazing and thank you for this opportunity. I'm super, super, super grateful. Well, we, we're excited for your, the, to see the final edit next month. I, I'm shooting Saturday, so we'll see. What Very happens. good. Very good. Um, and Gus, I'll just say I, I worked with Gus and it was really fantastic to have the chance to work with you ha having just um, finished your degree and also um, working on with you for the Aperture Summer Open last year, I could get a sense of your vision, um, the way you make images really fast and your attention to color. And it was it was really fantastic to see the work that you had already made um, and the way that you carried your style um, into this project. And also that you just connected so well to this great novel called Improvement, which I think really informed both, for both of us a way of shaping narrative on your work. Anyway, uh, over to you um, for your kind of last thought here. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I'll say, first of all, you definitely pushed pushed me into the world after college. Um, the inspiration of like getting out every day or trying to get out every day and make pictures um, and confront the way that the political landscape is today, the way that COVID is. And, and um, I, I think one of the one of the great things about working with an editor is that, you know, you're an encyclopedia of images. And you're helping me see pictures in a way that I couldn't before. Um, you like we're, we're talking, and you and you reference like a a Walker Evans picture of of baseball cards, and then it starts starting to see connections in history and how how again like the latent thing about images and how you see an image and you don't realize that you're making the same image um, out by finding out in the world. Um, and this specific body of work has kind of pushed me to continue to make work about New York City. Um, and I've been, as soon as we made our first edit, um, I continued to make those images. Um, and I'm trying to make a body of work about, about tokens of New York and try to see what's overlooked and see what people leave behind and what people, um, the signs that we use to communicate that you, you leave a little you leave some graffiti or you drop your lottery ticket or you drop your keys on the ground and we kind of have this little dialogue on the streets of the city. So um, this this was the catalyst for that. So it was great to work. Well, we look forward to it. And I also want to thank you for your openness because at one point I asked you to go and reshoot two scenes and you did and it was great. So I'm glad that you were open to doing that. Um, um, an improvement, you have to read it. It was, it was also it put you in this, Product placement, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful book.
Javier, do you want to say something just in by way of conclusion here? Yes, I mean, in, in general, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it, it was sort of like magical, honestly, like just to, you know, to hear from all of you that it, it was so timely, it was so perfect, just run on time for all of us for different reasons. That was just so magical and bizarre and great and I don't know I still sometimes can't believe it you know it's just like sometimes I see the camera around and I look at my wall and it's like wait this just happened like we just got this opportunity and and of course working with Nicole and Camila who wrote a beautiful piece for for the the project uh it was such an, a great experience and the 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 way that um the patience of, for 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 the timings and the, the processes the and and the the approach and all of that and like being able to have that sort of freedom of you know, just you know don't have any type of not censorship but you know like sort of like uh you know delicacy or different topics that was that was also great so this this has been just an amazing experience uh, I'm really looking forward to to see Silvana's uh, project hopefully soon, uh, and uh, I I hope we can we will do this uh, you know we can have a drink sometime together. Uh, I don't know it's 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 been a great experience overall, and I'm 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 super grateful for it. So likewise, thank you so we, much, and we will really look forward to seeing your this project grow in the work that you've done with the family. Definitely. Thank you. And Chen, we, we give you the last the last words of the of the evening. Sure. So um first I want to say thank you to Aperture. Yeah, it was really a, you know, just very enjoyed uh, the whole process because it's very collaborative. And I also want to thank you, uh Casty. Uh and yeah, because I feel it's hard to find an editor like who really understands you and who can also push you at the same time. So I really enjoy, you know, even though it's very intense that like every Friday, you know, we, um, we meet each other, but it's also very inspirational as well. And I believe I will miss our Friday meetups. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that also, it's just nice to also explore different kind of tools. So for, for example, the cameras and, now I also explore different mediums, you know, kind of step into the video to, um, to kind of ex experiment a little bit about different kinds of storytelling. So I'm really uh, looking forward to you know, continuing this project as well. And yeah, and hopefully one day soon that we will all, you know, meet together in person and mm -hmm. also just chat, you know, how our project goes and to continue our conversation. <laughs> Wonderful. And finally, last but not least, with Lean. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that ended up happening as a result of this, of starting this project was my approach to making work. Sometimes I tend to get stuck in my head uh, thinking of how to construct this perfect image. And so I think in making this work, I relied less on that and more on uh, whimsical side of myself and I think that's an approach I'm interested in taking to my other projects that I'm working on now yeah and just being open with whatever comes out yeah. well thank you so much you've really shown us um what tomorrow looks like from five very very different diverse poetic um politically conscious um, and significant bodies of artwork. So we thank you all so much. And thank you all, everyone who joined the call tonight. We hope you will join Aperture's newsletter at aperture.org um, and stay tuned for the fifth and final piece by Silvana and um, follow these artists on Instagram. If there are any editors in the audience, commission them. We wanna see you grow um, and make great work. So thank you all so much and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.